All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. We are we are in our penultimate class. Second, second to last class. Uh, it's it's hard to believe we've come this far, but we are we are this close. You can see the light coming at the end of the tunnel. It's actually an oncoming train. I'm kidding. Uh, uh, okay, so <laughs> all right. So today we are doing exactions and inverse condemnation. On Monday, we have eminent domain and kilo, and that, my friends, is it. That's it. Uh, a reminder, on the 25th from 10 to 1, we'll have a review session. Uh, we'll be going over the uh, questions from last year's exam. I'll print it out, distribute a few. Don't have to bring anything. Uh, bring yourself. Um, if you have any questions in the next week or so, email me. We can set up a time to talk, um, and hopefully you'll be ready. Um, is this your last exam or close to it? Middle? Second. Second. Oh, wow. When, when's your first one? Oh, my, my 1Ls have it on uh, the second. That's just like one of the first days of the exam period. Okay, so this is, you have some time. So I'll be, I'll be around if you need to ask questions. Um, before we get too far, I have these reviews. Can someone volunteer to bring these up later after class? Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll distribute these at the end of class. Um, okay. Uh, I want to thank you all. You all very well prepared for Judge Busby's class. Uh, he, he told me he was very impressed. Not every semester they... Some semesters they don't take the guest lecture seriously, which is disappointing, but you all did very well, so I'm, I'm very glad for that. Um, again, if you have any um, needs for internships and you want to apply to Judge Busby, uh, please send me your resume and I will gladly pass it on to him. Um, also, I repeat, if any of you are interested in a con law seminar I'm teaching in the spring, it's a two-credit class, meets Thursdays from 5.30 till 7.30, uh, I recommend you take it. Um, even if you don't have your 45 credits yet, if you'll have them next semester, you can do it. You will need a writing requirement, and I, I'm sure you will enjoy writing with me because it's a topic I enjoy immensely. So if you can finish your schedule, please do. Uh, I'm not scheduled to teach this again for a long time, so this is, this is probably your only shot till you graduate. All right. Questions? Scratching? Okay. People scratch a lot, as I've noticed. Okay. So let's, let's talk about regulatory takings. And let's run through uh, a list of the different tests that we've done. Okay, so the first case we did was Loretto. This was the phone booth case, right? Uh, the, the phone cable case. And Loretto is this permanent physical invasion test. What does it mean to have a permanent physical invasion? When you literally drill a wire on the side of a building, you need a hammer, you need a nail, you are permanently physically invading it. Even if the wire is only a couple inches thick, it doesn't matter. This is what's called a categorical taking. What does that mean, categorical taking? There's no balancing. The mere fact that you have this permanent physical invasion, automatic taking. When you see the word categorical, you may also see the word per se. Just think automatic, okay? The second test we did was Penn Coal. This is our favorite opinion by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who had the case involving the coal mine, that if you dig underneath the coal, the house will fall into the earth. And they, the state passed a law saying that you can't dig around a house. And Justice Holmes found that it was a taking. What was a test to use? Well, it wasn't very helpful, but it became known as a diminution in value. Okay? If a law diminishes the value of property, it's a taking. How much does it have to diminish? Well, it goes too far. This was Justice Holmes' entirely unhelpful test that a regulatory taking occurs when you diminish value and it goes too far. Okay? It would take another you know, 70 years for the Supreme Court to revisit this issue and decide when is it that a diminution in value uh, 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 works well. Okay? Third, we had the Hatachek case. Okay? This was the case with the, the brick baking. Remember where they, they extracted the clay from the earth and they uh, baked the bricks. Okay. Was the law banning the baking of the bricks a regulatory taking? Well, you may think so if you had red pen coal. They diminished the value of the property significantly. But this case was actually occurred before Hatachek. I'm listing like this deliberately. The Hatachek case said, no, no, no. If it's something involving a nuisance, 
it's within the police power, okay? And there's no taking. Banning the baking of, of these uh, clay bricks inside the coal mine, I'm sorry, inside the city limits was considered a nuisance at common law. And because it was a nuisance at common law, you could actually ban this, this process, okay? So that was the, the state of taking law for some time. But then we get to the 1970s, where everything, everything goes to crap uh, in many respects. And we get to the case of Penn Central. This was the case involving the decision to construct a tower on top of the train station, a Grand Central Terminal. Okay? Even though the train station was profitable and they were running business and they were earning money, they wanted to expand and build this you know, tower on top. And I showed you the various blueprints. Um, the city of New York banned this decision saying, you know what, uh, this is a historical site and you can't make these changes to the building without a permission. And oh, by the way, we'll never grant you permission, so you can't do it. Okay? So this went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court found that there was no taking, right? And they had these various factors, but the one I want you to remember is DIBI, which stands for Distinct Investment Act Expectations. In other words, when some rule diminishes the value of a piece of property, in order to determine whether it's a taking, you have to see whether there are these uh, investment back expectations. In, in, in doing something new, okay? Specifically, what does this mean? At the time when they were considering building up the skyscraper on top, had they actually invested any money in doing so? And Justice Brennan, he said, no. I explained to you that this was sophistry in the worst of Brennan because they couldn't have invested any money because they weren't allowed to build. So, so Penn Central is just like this horrible death spiral where you can't really get out of, and very few people actually claim victorious. But courts look to, did the person have these expectations? But one caveat, which Judge Busby added yesterday that I want to stress, is Penn Central only applies if it's less than a complete diminution in value. Okay? And I'll explain this more in a minute, but this was how the Tahoe court tried to reconcile, had a check, and Penn Central and Penn Coal. What do I mean by this? The train station was still operating just fine, right? There was no problem with the train station. So they were still having some sort of economic value, right? There was still some economic value in the property. So it can't be said that there was a complete deprivation of value, okay? So when there's less than a complete deprivation of value, Penn Central applies. This is how you link up Penn Coal and Penn Central. Let me walk you through that. Penn Coal says it's a taking if it goes too far, right? But what's too far? What Penn Central says is it goes too far when you're disrupting these dibbies, right? What they try to do is link those two cases which aren't really linkable. So the Penn Central test only applies when there's less than a complete diminution in value, okay? Where this trips people up substantially for the exam is when people apply the wrong test. It happens every year, I'm sure it'll happen to you. And it's not, it's not easy because these are very overlapping. So what you have to ascertain when you're, when you're writing your, your exam paper is, you know, first, are we talking about a physical Invasion. If we are, you say Loretto and you stop. Do not pass go. I don't want to talk about balancing. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about dibbies. You stop at Loretto. Okay, now if we're talking about something that's not physical, then you have to go down these other ones. Okay, so let's add to this list number five, which is Lucas. This was a South Carolina case, right? But Justice Scalia said the guy had that beachfront property and he couldn't put anything there. They said, oh, you can like build a tent there or something. Scalia said, this is stupid. So what Scalia said, and the facts were somewhat in dispute, is that when there's a complete diminution in value, it's a taking. 
unless it's a common law nuisance. Unless the rule polices a common law nuisance. Okay, so let, me, let, me, let me explain this one because it's not obvious either. Okay. Leah was basically saying Penn Cole is still the rule. When you deprive something of all of its value, that is that is literally that's literally going too far. Right? When you deprive someone of all the value of their property under Justice Holmes's formulation, that goes too far. Okay? But but here's the important but. Scalia tries to work in Hadachek into this, right? How is it that Hadachek didn't go too far? The way Scalia threads this needle is by saying, if there's a common law nuisance, then you can deprive someone of all their value, right? Let me explain this one more time. The reason why the city of Los Angeles could shut down the brickyard, even though that deprived of all of its value, was that they were trying to fix a common law nuisance, right? Air, smoke, whatever, noise. The only time the government can deprive your value entirely if it's to stop a common law nuisance. Okay? But what if we're not dealing with a common law nuisance? What if we're dealing with these newfangled environmental laws or these newfangled historical zones? Is that a common law nuisance? No. Is putting a skyscraper on top of a train station a common law nuisance? Of course not. Is telling someone they can't build a house by a lake a common law nuisance? Of course not. So Scalia says when you tell someone they can't build and you deprive someone of all their value, it's a taking. Okay. So the, so the important thing about Lucas, remember, is that what effectively Scalia is saying whenever any modern regulatory state issue deprives someone of all value, it's a taking. Okay, everyone with me so far. But alas, as is often the case, Justice Scalia does not get the last laugh. Oh, yes. Uh, so on Lucas, the statute still would uh, not categorize the taking if you bought with notice of the statute, but you bought after the statute. Um, I think that's right. Yeah, I, th I think that's right, but we're assuming here there's no notice. We're assuming here that the record changed afterward. Sorry. Okay. All right, everyone with me so far. All right. So then we get again to what we might call, you know, Justice Stevens strikes back. I think I think I blurred that out in class and I was probably rude to Justice Busby, but I, I think it makes an important point. The court wasn't happy, or at least the liberals in the court were not happy with Lucas, because it made a very strong role for states not enforcing environmental laws, right? It made it very tough for states to enforce environmental laws. So that takes us to six, which is a case called Tahoe Sierra. Right? This was the case on, uh, on Lake Tahoe in Nevada, California. And there were serious environmental issues there, and the government put on this moratorium on building. Right, and they kept saying, oh, this is, you know, a temporary moratorium, like, only for a couple more years, and a couple more years, and before you know, it's like, like 10 years, you can't build anything. So you think that under Lucas, this would be a complete diminution in value, okay? But Justice Stevens reads it differently. What Justice Stevens says is that this is a less than complete diminution in value. Let me explain this. Stephen says, listen, even though you can't build, you still have some value to the land. So even if you take away 99.9% .9 of the value of the land, you still have that 0.1%. And therefore, it's not a complete diminution. When you have a less than a complete diminution, which test you apply? Penn Central. Right? You go back to your dibbies. So Lucas and Tao Sierra are the bookends of this entire topic of regulatory takings, right? When something's a complete diminution value, it's a taking unless there's a common law. 
But for practical purposes today, Tau Sierra controls. Even a moratorium on building saying you cannot build something indefinitely, if that's not a complete diminution of value, then nothing is. So it's going to be a very rare case today where Lucas is a controlling law. Uh, so in Tau's here, it wasn't, it wasn't completely because it was temporary? Or? Well, Justice Stevens was being Justice Stevens. Uh, uh, one second. Oh, yeah. So Justice Stevens was being Justice Stevens, and um, he was basically finding a way to rule and say that, well, Scalia was wrong. But let me put it this way. Stevens couldn't go out and say Scalia was wrong. He couldn't reverse Lucas. So instead, what he did was he said, okay, the facts are different, right? I find that these temporary, temporary moratoriums are not complete diminutions in value. Therefore, we're not controlled by Lucas. We didn't go too far in terms of Penn Coal. We go back up to Penn Central. Okay. Good. Okay. Yes. Um, if Penn Cole was decided under Lucas. Oh, now you're killing me. Um, well, Penn Cole was decided seven years before Lucas. So, so, but, but, uh, ask your question. I think I know where you're going with this. Okay. I, you know. Yeah. So, so your question is. Right, was the Penn Coal statute a complete diminution of value? Is that your question, effectively? Well, the, 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 law, the law in Penn Coal, where they, they said you can't mine, was that a complete diminution of value? Well, in Penn Coal, they said that it was a taking because it went too far. Because it went too far yet. Right. And in Penn Coal, it was only the one spot where the house was on a giant piece of land. And under Lucas, that would be well, that's an interesting question. So according to Justice Holmes, if you go back to Holmes' opinion, Penn Cole, it was complete diminution of value. Remember, this was the parcel, was the whole idea. In dissent, Justice Brandeis said, listen, maybe you can't drill here, but you can drill here and you can drill here. Holmes rejected it. He said, listen, if we're looking only at this segment, there's a 100% diminution of value. So under Holmes, he would say this is a complete diminution of value. You see, they were trying to thread these cases. So today, as it stands, okay, today as it stands, almost every single case will be governed by Penn Central, right? Unless it's a permanent physical invasion, I'm sorry, a permanent physical occupation, we're in Penn Central land. It's, gonna be, it's going to be the very rare, rare, rare case where a court finds a complete diminution in value per lucas. I'm not saying it'll never happen. I mean, maybe in the exam, I'll make it so abundantly clear that there's a complete diminution. You have to know Lucas applies. But if you're not sure and you want to hedge your bets, say Penn Central. Explain why, though. You can't, you can't just go there. You have to say something, you know, there's a less than complete diminution of value. So under Tau Sierra, we apply the Lucas test. I'm sorry. Under Tau Sierra, we apply the Penn Central test. And then once you get to Penn Central, talking about the dibbies, talking about the, invest, uh, the investment back expectations, and then I think you have the, the basis for an answer. Okay, other questions on this? Yes, that's okay. Given Lucas case, if you apply it under Penn Central, would you say, could you argue it's not complete diminution because he still has the limit? Exactly. And then his investment back expectations be the money he got to purchase the land? Okay, so the first part, I think you're right. The second part, a little bit off. So the first part was the train station still operated. It cannot be said there's a complete diminution of value because the train station is still operating. Okay, so now we go to Penn Central. And were there any distinct investment back expectations on building the skyscraper, right? The answer is no. But the reason why the answer is no is because they weren't allowed to build anything. You can't break ground without a building permit, and the city won't give you a building permit until you jump through all the hoops. So this is, this, is the, this is the Penn Central death spiral I talk about. You can't get out of it. But effectively, once you start asking, did the person invest money in something they're not allowed to do, the answer is always going to be no. You can't invest money in something you cannot do. This is why Penn Central is almost always a trap. Now, there are cases where you can win under Penn Central, but it's, it's the outlier. Can't you, though, I mean, 
isn't there sometimes when people will basically start uh, <laughs> a, a construction project knowing that they may not be able to do it and start raising money? And then That's not a very good way to uh, build. Imagine you're a construction company, right? You say, okay, so we want to break ground tomorrow, but next week we might get a court injunction telling us to stop. Your creditors will say, don't do that, right? Your business partner will say, don't be an idiot. Um, this is what's happening now with Ashby, where this, you know, I talk about the Ashby high rise. This has been going on now for I think six or seven years where all these construction costs keep adding up. And the legal fees in that case are gonna be unbelievable. I can't even imagine they're, they're gonna be high. So generally speaking, if you're a contractor, you're not going to build something until you have all your paperwork in order. You're not going to say, oh, let, let's hope the court rules in our favor. Right? That's not a, that's not a particularly wise method of uh, business. But I mean, you could have a loan from a bank, you know, have money in the bank waiting to build, and the only barrier is that there's a ordinance saying that you can't build, you know, you can't build that there. Yeah. Or whatever, basically. Yeah. And that would pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Why is not I mean, they obviously spent money on architects, engineers, in order to draw up these plans for the tower. Why is that not an investment? Because it wasn't distinct enough. I mean, I really am being pedantic, but the core base <laughs> said these are not distinct enough. They're too, they're too um, speculative. Is there money just being put in the bank and speculative This is why ten, Penn Central is a death spiral. You really can't win. Brent, Brennan stacked the deck in a way that you really can't win. So having money in the bank is not going to pass? No. Nope. It's got to be distinct investments backed against us. On the final exam, if you have a scenario where they've got everything laid out right. and they've got all the money ready to go they've got everybody lined up all the contracts are signed and the only thing in the way is the statute that's not gonna pass yeah you're screwed okay you don't win that's why brennan did this you can't win oh okay. uh, here yeah oh good yeah so unless you say that the value of the land is completely wiped out you know, completely that's right. And that, that's not me. That's Justice, that's Justice Scalia. So basically, regulatory takings today, unless you're in Loretto, you lose. I mean, it's possible, but it's not common. So the less than initial value, like you said, is they, they, there has to be something to say, like Justice said, for the um, expectation for the money. But if like, they can't do it, then there can't be. You don't win. I mean, th there, there are studies done on Penn Central, and like the government wins almost all the time. Like, I'm sure it's over 90%, right? You, it, it's very rare that you can say successful Penn Central. It happens. Like, don't get me wrong. But by and large, under Brennan, Sess, and Penn Central, the government wins. The, you know, the sun rises in the east, sets in the west, and the government wins. That's just Brennan's philosophy in most things. Yeah? Can you retroactively apply the statute after building starts? So this is one place where Penn Central you can win. Okay, so imagine had they already started constructing this tower, and then suddenly in the middle they, they said, oh, wait a minute, no, now it's a historical site. This is a case where we've actually invested money. So this is one of the rare cases, contrary to this question, where when you start building, it's legal, but then it becomes illegal in the middle, right? This, that, that's a very good point of where you might be able to win a case. So for the Ashby high rise, they're the nuisance thing, they Yeah. They win on the nuisance thing, they start building, and then somebody passes a statute or in the city ordinance that's a contradiction of the actual kind of I mean, they would have a pretty decent Penn Central claim at that point. <clears throat> but generally speaking, in most cities, the zoning laws are such that you can't build without permission, right? There's so many gates that they won't give you permission to build in the first place. All right, questions? All right, so copy this, put in your notes, study it, learn it, repeat it, try and get the map, try and get the flow. If you want, go back and watch the first 20 minutes of this class again on, the, on, on YouTube uh, because I think this will be a nice uh, uh, synthesis of the uh, last couple weeks. Yes? Um, um, you get the stuff from, uh, YouTube. Yeah, okay. it's on there. Yeah, there's a YouTube channel with all the classes added. All right, let's, do, let's go ahead and do the exactions and condemnation. So 
We've discussed at great length this topic of condemnation, right? And condemnation generally means the government comes to you and says, hey, you know, we really like your house. We like where it is. We want to knock it down and build a park. We'll give you some money for it. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't want to do business with us? Oh, okay. Then we'll go to court and make you. Okay. So this is condemnation, right? Condemnation is when the government says, give us your house and we will pay you. You cannot say no to that. And we'll talk about Kilo next time. But the general answer is, once the government decides they want to use the judicial process to take your home, you should probably call a travel agent and, and, and you know move somewhere else. Or a real estate agent, I should say. But what about the opposite, right? Say the government passes a law saying, uh, you know what? You can't build here. You own the land, but you can't build here. Or if the government says, you know what? That land next to that uh, beach is really nice, right? If you want to build here, you have to give us an easement for the public. We won't pay you for it, but give it to us. Okay. Now, there's no question that the government, if they wanted, could use their powers to uh, uh, condemn land by a beach, right? They'd have to pay you for it. This problem arises when the government doesn't want to pay up. So this is not the problem of condemnation. This is the problem of the inverse condemnation. I saw this wrong. Condemnation. Inverse condemnation is when the government passes a regulation that restricts the use of your land. Okay? But they don't want to pay you for it. In other words, the government wants to commit a taking and they don't want to pay for it. So what happens? The property owner goes to court. And the property owner says, hey, wait a minute. This law you passed is a taking. Pay up. Right? If you want this easement, if you want this land, pay me. Everyone understand that? All right. So we understand the difference between condemnation and inverse condemnation. Okay. One other terminology which the book, for whatever reason, doesn't even bother explaining, I don't know why, is an exaction, right? The entire topic is an exaction. Never actually define what that means. And the word isn't exactly self explanatory, right? So exaction generally means a condition the government makes you do before you build something. Right? Before you build something, it's a condition the government makes you do. And some exactions seem to make a lot of sense, right? If you want to build some building downtown, it would make sense for the government to say, okay, if you want to build this building, you need to have a sidewalk in front of it, right? What sense is there if there's a building if there's no sidewalk in front of it? Uh, you know, if you want to build a building here, you, the developer, have to pay for the sewage hookup, right? Why are you going to make the city pay for the sewage hookup for a residential building? Right? So an exaction is simply just saying a condition, if you want this building permit, if you want to build here, that's fine, but do something for me. And traditionally, these are viewed as what's called printing money for the government. Right? Why is it like printing money for the government? Because the government has, does not have to do a thing and they get all this free stuff. They get a new sidewalk, right? They get a new sewage hookup. Okay. Is it an exaction to have like a fire escape or something That would probably be more of a safety code than an exaction. Exaction is usually building something around your building. I think the the, the you know the fire sprinklers, whatever, would be a, a safety code. <laughs> So generally speaking, developers don't mind these too much, right? I mean, it makes a lot of sense if you're building some high rise, you have to take care of sidewalks and sewer connections because they benefit everyone. But what if exactions start going a little bit too far? So imagine this circumstance, right? Imagine a circumstance where uh, a city says, okay, you know what? If you want to build a building here, you have to pay for a park somewhere else because that way the kids will have somewhere to play. You might say to yourself, wait a minute, what does this have to do with my property? Or 
if you're in New York City and you want to build a high-rise luxury condo, the city says to you, okay, that's fine, but you have to dedicate 10% of your units to rent control departments. This actually happens. In New York City, every time you want to build any sort of uh, expensive condominiums, con condominiums, you're required to build low-income housing in the same building. So what happens in New York, and this is whole thing, I, I laugh, is you have two sets of doors. So say you have a, uh, say you have a high rise facing the East River, right? You have all the apartments facing the East River, you know, that are luxury with this, you know, doorman, all these nice facilities, right? And then you have the other half of the building <laughs> with a door on the back side, without a doorman, without a pool, without a gym, and with all these low income housing or rent control apartments. And you have these developers who are actually cutting their buildings in half so they can accommodate this. Now, what's really funny is that a number of the tenants on the backside are suing, saying it's not fair. We can't access the pools and the gyms and the doorman. <sighs> Welcome to New York. So this is why housing is so expensive in New York, in part. But these are often uh, 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 various forms of exactions. Okay. Uh, so, any questions on that? The question becomes, though, at what point are these exactions unconstitutional? At what point do these conditions become so coercive and so detrimental to the value of your property that they go too far? Now, what confuses the heck out of people about this topic is that it doesn't really fit any of these six tests. And you may have had this thought, hopefully, while you're reading for today. Exactions don't really fit neatly into any of these, right? Because on the one hand, you say, well, you know, if, if the, uh, take, no, take uh, uh, the, the Nolan, for, for example, right, or, 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 or <laughs> the first case, the beach case, so we can confuse. You take the beach case, for example, right? It's like, well, well, maybe she had to give an easement for part of her sand, but she sold the rest of it. So that means it's a less than complete diminution of value. That means we're in Penn Central, and that means they lose. So the odd thing about the exactions is it's almost a totally different standard. It's a standard unto itself, and this, again, is Justice Scalia versus Justice Stevens, and here Scalia has something of the last laugh on this one. So when the government tries to diminish the value of your property and they don't want to pay for it, like they don't even attempt for it, and then the citizen comes and says, all right, fine, I'll give it to you, but pay me for it, it's a lot easier to win. So both Nolan and Dolan represent very good cases for property owners, where property owners can actually win. You're much more likely to win on an exaction case than you are to win on a Penn Central case. So what I don't want you to see in the exam, and I know it's gonna happen, is if there's an exaction, do not tell me about Penn Central. Okay? Do not tell me about Dibbies. Don't tell me about Tahoe Sierra. If there's an issue with an exaction, and you'll be able to spot those, tell me about Nolan and Dolan. They, they rhyme even to make it easier for you. I think this was deliberate on behalf of the Supreme Court. They found cases that rhyme. But Nolan and Dolan, Okay. Okay. Everyone, everyone with me so far. Okay. All right. So let's go on to the Nolan versus the California Coastal Commission. If those of you who don't know, the CCC, the Coastal Commission, uh, 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 has regulations governing construction all along the California coastline. On the specific, specific on the Pacific Ocean. All right, where was I last time? Who was last up? Thank you. I love your honesty. I have to admit, some classes do not ever raise their hands, and it's a weird culture. So I do appreciate you. You are very good on that. All right, so uh, Rebecca, what what happened in in, in Nolan? So um, Nolan currently has this awesome beachfront property in Ventura County, California, and was originally leasing it with this option to buy it and had rented it out, it had a bungalow on it, and bungalow went to crap. And <laughs> that, that's a term of art, by the way. It means it was in bad shape. 
and uh, <laughs> so no one's option. There was an option to purchase it. Uh -huh. However, it was conditioned on um, his promise to to fix the bungalow and replace it. Okay. And by the way, th th this this was the went to crap bungalow. In case you want to know, this was this was this is what it looked like. It, it was it was fairly crappy. Please continue. Um. So he obtained a permit from the Coastal Commission, and in '82 submitted this permit to apply. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, well, um, get rid of the bungalow, and build a three-story or three-bedroom house that kind of conforms with all the other mm -hmm. houses in the neighborhood. And this is where they were like, well, we'll let you do it if you let people come on. We can put an easement on your land. Okay, and let's be very precise, okay? They want what's called a lateral easement. So effectively, we, we studied already that you're required to give someone the right to cross your land into the water, right? We discussed this with the Jersey Shore case. Okay. What they want is something parallel to the surf parallel to the water. This was the same deal as the beach club. Remember they said, okay, we'll give you the short strip of land right by the right by the waterline, but the rest of it could be the private club. What the California Coastal Commission was saying is, we want you to dedicate an easement running like this. Here, I'll, I'll show you this other picture, it's a little bit more clear, right? Here's this storm wall, right? They wanted the land parallel to the storm wall, okay? So the idea was people would not only be able to walk from the street to the beach, but also along the entirety of the beach and not just by the tide. Everyone get the, get the general gist? Okay. They weren't asking about being able to cross to the water. That's already, that's already required as a matter of law. Okay? Very good. So, Stephanie, what, what happened in his process of trying to apply for uh, uh, the permit to build? What was the process like? Well, the trial court said that... They granted the permit for the easement, saying that if the easement wasn't there, we could have visual access. To the uh -huh. And I got the document that they talked about a psychological barrier. Yeah, okay. So, what, what is this? I'm sorry, I always laugh when you just case I think it's ridiculous. So, what, what is this psychological barrier? What, what, <laughs> explain, please. My understanding was that it would make people not want to go to the beach if they couldn't, if the house was so big, if they couldn't see the beach or they Okay, good. So let me put on my Justice Brennan hat for a minute, and I'll take away my here. Oh, don't need this. So let me take away my Justice Brennan hat for a minute. Okay, and I can drop the Constitution. So um, here's the thinking, right? If I am walking or driving, no, bicycle. We're in California. If I'm riding a bike along the main street, right, and I see that all this sand is empty, I will get this psychological burden saying, "Oh man." What am I going to do? There's no one walking on this beach. Maybe I can't walk there, even though you're allowed to cross. But it's like, I don't know what to do if I can't cross into this beach. What am, what am I supposed to do? I'm going to ride my bike to the beach 500 yards away and go there instead. <sighs> okay. So the California Coastal Commission, their infinite wisdom, said, no, we cannot have this, this intentional infliction of emotional distress on these people riding their bikes on the Pacific Coast Highway. So instead, if they see all these other people walking along the beach, like, oh, wait a minute, look, they're walking there, maybe I can too. Let me cross and let me go hang out on the beach and hang 10, right? Okay. I'll put my constitution back near my heart. Okay, so this is ridiculous, okay? I mean, it doesn't really make any sense, but the fact it doesn't make any sense is besides the point. And, and again, Justice Scalia, I think, does this point fairly well, okay? Um, the mere fact that this problem exists is only one issue. The more important question is what on earth does this have to do with his decision to build a house? Okay, let's walk through this. So I can understand if the, if the commission said, and, and I'll go to, go to Hugo for this, right? Say the government said, you know what? We want people to be able to see the beach, right? So you need to leave you know, say 20 feet on either side of your property where you cannot build. That way there's a direct line of sight to the beach. Does that rule make sense? Yes. Why, why does that make sense? Uh, because it's going more towards the, I guess, the regulation of the house size as opposed to the individual. But, but more important than that, 
Is there a connection between not building here and the government's goal of having you know this visual access? What's the link? What's the connection? It's obvious, right? It's a fairly obvious idea saying if you want to build, you can have a lot size of this many feet with an offset so that there's visual aesthetic access. And Hugo, does Justice Clay think that would be a taking? Okay, that's right. That would not be a taking for the simple reason, right, that it relates. Okay? And this is where I think there's actually a very good discussion of scrutiny. And I find that far too many law students use the word scrutiny and have absolutely no idea what it means. They never actually thought it through, right? So let's actually break this down a little bit, right? So we talk about strict scrutiny, right? And we have these, we have these words, narrowly tailored, right, to serve uh, to serve a, uh, a compelling governmental interest, right? What does that actually mean? Have you ever actually stopped and think and look at the words? Narrowly tailored to serve a compelling governmental interest. Okay, so what does something, let's assume you have something tailored, well, the same way you have a suit, and you know, you can take in the sides, and you can you know, let out the waist, so it has, as it may be, as you get older, right? When you're saying it's narrowly tailored, you're talking about an issue of fit, right? How close is the fit between what the government is doing and what the government wants to do? So in the case I just asked Hugo about, right? If your goal is to protect visual access to the beach and you say you can't build here because you block visual access, that's a pretty close fit, isn't it? Right? That, that makes a lot of sense. Now, a synonym for the word fit is nexus. You might have heard of Lexus nexus, right? Well, what the heck is nexus? Nexus means like an intersection point or things come together. So there's a very tight fit or nexus between, you know, the government's desire to have visual access and the saying you can't build there. Okay? Now what's the thing about compelling governmental interest? Well, this is the easier part, right? It's gotta be damn important. Really important, right? The government can't choose any goal. They have to choose goals that are important. Okay. And, and we study why is we have strict scrutiny rather than, say, rational basis. Well, because the court, in their infinite wisdom, said these rights are very important. Right? This is such an important right that we are going to make sure the government acts carefully with a very good goal in mind. If either of these are lacking, odds are it will fail strict scrutiny. And as I'm sure you studied in con law, virtually nothing passes strict scrutiny other than Michigan's affirmative action policy and detention of Japanese people in Korematsu. Uh, that's basically it. So that, that's your hierarchy of what survives strict scrutiny. Michigan affirmative action and Korematsu. Okay, priorities. So we have here then a question, right? What is the fit between what the government's trying to do and the condition they're demanding? Now, uh, uh, Shmaira, what 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 test would Justice Brennan apply um, in the dissent? How would he how would he judge this? Um, Justice Brennan in the dissent. What was his proposed test? Oh, what was his proposed test? In the dissent. Um, how would Justice Brennan have considered the fit between the means and the ends? He said it doesn't fit. He says that. No, no. The the, the dissent. Justice Brennan, not Scalia. Brennan. Here, I'll drop my constitution again. Brennan. Artemio? What? Stop answer. Allow it. Yeah, I mean, well, of course, of course, Justice Brennan would allow it. But but how, what kind of fit would he be looking for? Anyone? Rational. Exactly. Brennan, in dissent, and, and he, he never met a government program he didn't like, uh, uh, would apply some sort of a rational basis test, right? He would effectively say, as long as the government has some sort of rationale about why this, is a, why this w idea works, it doesn't have to be a good idea. As long as they have any idea that might make sense, government wins. In fact, as I'm sure you studied under a case called Williamson v. Lee Optical, which was the canonical standard of rational basis, the government can actually make up reasons why they did this. They can just fictional, you know, like Harry Potter saying, oh yeah, this is what we wanted to do. Even worse, under Lee Optical, the court can make up reasons for the government. So after all the arguments have been submitted, 
after all the briefs are done, the judges can go back to their chamber and say, you know what? All the reasons the government gave are pretty bad. Let's make up a better one. And under the optical, that's perfectly permissible. So if you look very carefully, Brennan actually made up this psychological barrier reason. And Scalia says, that's better than what the government said. That's not what the government said, right? This is not something that we can just kind of finesse around. To Scalia, property rights are important. Zoe? Um, I have a from the dissent. It looks like Brennan is actually trying to apply something that is somehow even less strict than rational basis. It seems like they're saying, oh, no, we only have to show that they could have rationally decided it. So wouldn't that be, oh, no, we don't even have to prove that they have a rational basis. We just have to prove there's like a 50% chance they might have had a rational basis. Under, under Williamson Billy Optical, that's all you have to prove. Mm -hmm. Under the case of this, if you might remember from con law, uh, Williamson Billy Optical, or basically a state said, if you want to fit lenses, right, not make a prescription, but actually put a lens into a frame, you need to be a licensed out ophthalmologist, right? Or, but, but they said, there's no good reason for that. There's no good, uh, ophthalmologists, I'm sorry, optometrists can fit the lenses just fine. They don't need to have the doctor write the prescription first. So this rule basically had no rational basis whatsoever. None, zero, zilch, okay? The court upheld it, and Justice, you know, Justice Douglas, good old, good old William L. Douglas said, as long as we can even make up a reason why, this is why I often call the rational basis test a fraud. Uh, rubber stamp will be generous. Uh, uh, it's, it's effectively an abdication where the court says, we're not going to consider it. We're just going to make stuff up, throw it at the wall, and say the government wins. And this, this is Justice Brennan's solution. Now, perhaps Justice Scalia is wrong in the other way. Maybe he's a little bit too exacting, no pun intended. Right? Maybe he's a little bit too tough on the government. So Scalia doesn't really put forward a test, which is difficult. But he effectively uses this word, nexus. Right, uh, Artemio, how does Scalia talk about the nexus? What, what's this discussion there? Uh, I know he talks about Loretto, that physical taking the easement. Okay, so here, here, here's a good point, right? We're not talking, let's go back to our pictures to extend, right? We're not talking about a regulation that says you can't do this in the land or you can't do that in the land. Artemio, what is the government actually asking for? They're asking for, because he talks about the word access. Uh, Physical permanent easement. Is. So think about it like this. In this case, the exaction is literally a permanent physical occupation. Forever and ever, to infinity beyond, people will be able to walk along this land. His deed will now have that easement registered on it, and no matter who he sells it to, he can't get rid of that. Because the easement will be actually in favor of the government, and they are never going to release that easement. Won't happen. So in fact, here, Loretto, I think Artemio is right, this fits a little bit into Loretto because it's a permanent physical occupation. When the government demands that you give an easement and the government demands that you <coughs> give land to the government, it's Loretto. Uh, and go back up top, Sean, when we're talking about Loretto, is there any balancing? Usually, not, not in this case, generally speaking, when we do with Loretto, is there any balancing? Oh, no, it's just a ah, So why is there a balancing test applied here? If the answer is Loretto, why are we doing this kind of balancing about this nexus? This is one of the more tricky aspects of the case. Um, I agree with you that should be rational. He says that um, the public had an interest in the reach before the bank gets the mm -hmm. No, my, my question though is if under Loretto, we're not supposed to be balancing stuff, right? If there's a permanent physical occupation, boom, taking, why are we doing this balancing stuff here? Uh, Shamaya? Yeah. You, have, you have more of a choice. He doesn't have to build. It's not exactly. That's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's an exaction. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're getting there. It's, it's, it's not a, a condemnation where they're taking something from you. It's not an inverse condemnation where they're telling you that you can't do something. They're requiring That's you a condition. to give up something. I think you're on the right track. Okay, there's not. It's actually not a clear answer. I think your answers are pretty good, if I may say so. Um, the issue here is he doesn't have to do this, right? With Loretto, the law demanded that he put the the cable on his building, right? The law said you are required to put this cable on your building, and we'll give you a dollar for it. Here they're saying, okay. Demolish your house and leave it a vacant lot. 
And if you leave it a vacant lot, you can live there. Don't need to give us an easement. Oh, but if you want to build something, then, then you need to come to us. And as we saw under Tahoe Sierra, which hadn't been decided yet, but we'll assume it was, under Tahoe Sierra, having a vacant lot has value. You can camp on the beach. You can look at the waves. You can admire the birds, whatever else people do, right? So the mere fact that they're making this as a condition takes you something outside of Loretto. So Artemio is right that Loretto is the basic test, but we have to go to this nexus test, right? Everyone see that? So uh, going back again to Derek, Derek, tell me again, how does Scalia approach this nexus test? Not not rational, but but nexus test. Yeah. So how how does it work? What has to what does the government have to show? I mean, you've got to show a connection between the condition. Exactly. And, uh, yes. Exactly. The the nexus test, and we'll elaborate this on in the next case. But for purposes of Nolan, what Scalia says is, listen, show me a link, right? Show me a connection between what you want to accomplish and the means you're using to get there, right? You often see this in common law, like means and scrutiny. What does that even mean, right? Means end. What are the means you're choosing to do something, and what are the goal you're trying to accomplish, and what's the fit between the two? So Scalia doesn't actually give you a clear test, which is something that drove people crazy for like seven years. Um, some some courts flagrantly ignored Scalia, and they said, "Oh, we don't really need this nexus. We just adopt the rational basis test, or whatever." And I think we already discussed the Brennan um, dissent, but just as Brennan says and says, "Listen." We should not be second-guessing the, the experts at the California Coastal Commission. They know what they're doing, right? They are the experts. They have this you know, specialization in environmental law. Who are we but judges to know? He would limit review to rationality. And Brennan makes a point that Stevens made later in Tahoe Sierra. Even if he can't build, his land still has value. Um, if you take a look at this block by, by mere, you know, <laughs> Which of things is not like the other? I imagine an empty lot on this block would not be very valuable if they can't build there. But even there, Brennan says there's some value. And Brennan says we should trust the state. My favorite line is what Brennan says, the private landowners are the interlopers. The public's expectation of access predates the development. This is like the, the Barbara Streisand effect. If you, ever, if you ever know Barbara Streisand has a house in Malibu on the beach, and all these people were taking pictures, and she sued them, and you know it was this huge lawsuit, and she eventually lost. But the California beaches are very, very important to them, and it's very dangerous owning a property on it. All right, any questions on Nolan? All right, so flash, flash forward to 10 years later, I'm sorry, about seven years later, to Dolan versus City of Tigard from Oregon. If you'll note, this is an opinion not by Justice Scalia, but by Chief Justice Rehnquist. So uh, the chief took it away from Nino and said, "All right, let me let me do this right. Let me make like put some sense on this. Right? Let me actually put forward a test." Okay. So Hubs uh, William Rehnquist kept it for himself. And the issue here is, what do we make of this nexus test? Right? How do we how do we define this nexus? All right. So. Uh, uh, Catherine, can you please walk through, please, the facts of um, uh, uh, Dolan? Mm -hmm. Okay, and by the way, I don't want to interrupt you too much. So here's a satellite map of the issue in question. And you can see here, there's like a store, and there's like a shopping center, right? And there's all this green and nature stuff behind it. So at the outset, before we get too far, uh, uh, Alex, at the outset, if the state had said to the company, you can't build on all that green wetland, right? Would there be any problem whatsoever with that law? How come? Because the state has yeah. So generally speaking, if the state says you, Ms. Dolan, are not allowed to build and all this, you know, there's, there's this green wetland because you know in Portland we need our free range chickens to have their you know local homes, whatever, right? You can't do that. But Alex, let me ask a different question. 
what they said, not only are you not allowed to build, you have to sell, actually sells the wrong word, give the land to the government. This is what dedicate means, right? They, they can, they'll explain these terms. But to dedicate is this beautiful sounding word that means to give to the government for no money. Yeah. Dedicate means basically you hand it over to the government for, their, for the public for the public use. And it sounds beautiful. I dedicated this land to the public. Although in this case, Ms. Dolan wasn't really interested in doing so. So Alex, in this case, what was the significance of having them dedicate it rather than just not build on it? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, say the government had said, and then I'll, I'll ask this to Haley. Say the government said, you know, that, that wetland is beautiful. We want to turn it into a park. So we're going to use our power of image domain to seize it and turn it into a park. Is there any problem there? Here, though, what did they do? How did, how did they approach the issue? They made it a condition. They made it a condition. They said, okay, sure. If you want to expand your business, fine, but give us the land. It's almost like a form of extortion if you think about it, right? And was like, okay, that's really nice. You can do that if you give us some free stuff. Uh, usually it's called bribery unless the government does which is called the public good. Uh, 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 but that's generally how these things work. So they basically said, you can't build there, you can't expand your business, you can't pave the parking lot. So at a certain level, it makes sense, right? If you start paving with asphalt, water runs off. If there's dirt, water absorbs into the ground. So by paving stuff, you create a lot more risk for flooding. And as the book said, this was along what's called the 100-year flood plain. So you know, every century, there's going to be a massive you know, biblical flood, like in Johnstown. Except Johnstown had three floods in 100 years. It's cursed. So you, once in a century, you have these biblical floods, and the entire place will be flooded. So in that event, it would be worthwhile to have grass to absorb all the water. In fact, in Staten Island, where I'm from, one of the reasons why there was so much flooding with Hurricane Sandy is that there's been a lot of wetlands turned into development, and that the water could not absorb into the ground, and there was flooding. Okay? But they didn't just say, don't build here. They said, turn this land over to us. Okay, and what else, uh, uh, Aisha? What, what else do they have to do? In addition to uh, giving easement for the land and dedicate it, what were they required to uh, build on that spot? The bike lanes, right. Why did the government think it was necessary to build a bicycle pathway uh, behind this business? Right, because who knows what's best for business, the government, right? Basically, the government's saying, we think it'll actually improve your business if you put a dedicated bike lane here, right? So the government not only is asking them to hand over the land by the, by the river, but for the company to maintain, at their own cost, a bike lane, right? And presumably, because it's still theirs, they would have to be liable for torts on it. So had they maintained it negligently, they'd probably be liable for torts. I know you probably didn't think that far, but having a bike lane on your, on your property is actually not a safe thing. Right? You don't want people riding their bikes, you know, tripping on acid from Portland, and they fall into the river and sue you for negligence, right? Because you didn't clear the brush. Whatever. Whatever people do in Portland. I don't know. I've never been. Yes, yeah, Portlandia, right? So this gets to Supreme Court. All right. So uh, Katie, how does the Chief Justice handle this? What does the Chief Justice think of this program, this, this exaction? I'm sorry, say that again? Isn't it deprivation? Oh, deprivation, yes. I, I thought you said segregation, which didn't sound right. Yes, yes, a deprivation of the land use. Why, why is it a deprivation of, of their property value? Because you're not able to see. Yes, yes, yes. So we come back to our favorite trope. The most essential stick in the bundle is the right to exclude. They cannot exclude. In fact, they're required to include, right? They're required to let everyone with a bicycle in Portland ride down their trail trailblazing as it were, right? So the court discusses a thing called unconstitutional, I'm sorry, unconstitutional conditions, which you might have talked about in common law, but probably not. Okay, this doctrine of unconstitutional conditions basically says the government can't require you to give a constitutional right in order for a public, some sort of public use. 
So imagine you're living in public housing, right? And the government says, okay, you can live here for public housing, but you waive your Fourth Amendment right. Please search your house anytime because you live in public housing. You can't do that. Another example that comes up a lot, say you're on welfare. And the government says, okay, if you want welfare, that's fine, but you have to consent to random drug tests. No Fourth Amendment applies on constitutional condition. Right? You see this all the time to, to, to drug test welfare recipients. Uh, that's unconstitutional. So what, what Rehnquist is basically saying is you can't make someone give up their property in order to, to exercise their constitutional right, which is owning property. you got to pay them for it. If you want to pay for it, fine. So then we get to the test, right? Uh, 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 Adam, walk me through. Uh, Rehnquist has something like almost like a, a, a soliloquy, a dialogue about the right test. How does he... How does he come down on the appropriate test? Um, when we talk about the, the nexus, uh, I believe he talked about they did have a, a governmental interest in stopping or you know, helping with flood and stuff like that. Um, but there's a rough uh, proportionality test. Um, it says that they can make an individualized determination. Um, to the major of the impact of the okay. So Rehnquist is basically picking up Scalia's dirty laundry, right? Scalia had this case, Nolan, in the 87 or so, and he didn't really give us a good test. So the chief is trying to pick things up and help it make some sense. So instead of just saying nexus, he adds this other word, essential nexus, right? So you're basically looking for some sort of a tight fit between the legitimate state interest and the permit condition. But let's first think about this in terms of the last case, right? Was there a tight, was there a fit between the government's desire to have visual access to the beach and the easement? Not really, okay? But, I should probably delete this word. But the question is how tight must that fit be, right? Justice Brennan, in his dissent in the, in the, in the uh, Beach case, said, it doesn't have to be very tight at all. So long as there's some sort of rational basis, right? There's some sort of very weak link between what the government wants to do and, their, and what they're actually doing, it's fine. But Scalia had something more. So Rehnquist basically makes up this word, this, this rough proportionality. And you may have seen in, in the 14th Amendment context, in Bernie v. City of Flores, congruence and proportionality. Does that ring a bell? Should. So basically, proportionality means how closely does it fit, right? The words itself don't have much meaning, but it has to be basically not a perfect fit, not a weak fit, Goldilocks, just right, you know, somewhere in the middle. Um, and we don't have a clear decision of what this means. But what we can tell is that Rehnquist thought that neither the condition in the Beach case or the condition here suffice. And let's be very specific, right? In the beach case, he said there's not much of a link between the desire to have visual access to the beach and giving over the easement. Here, Rehnquist said much the same. It would be perfectly fine if the government said, you're not allowed to build in the Greenlands, right? That would not be a problem. But why do you have to give it over to the government? Is there any allegation that private individuals can't maintain land on wetlands? Even more so, what on earth does giving a bicycle path have to do with repaving a driveway? Right? They want to repave their driveway and expand their business. Why on earth would we need to pay, make a bike lane? So sure, the government makes up this argument saying, oh, well, maybe some of your employees and, and customers can come by bike. Well, that's maybe true, but it's very speculative. And it's not all clear if there's anything to justify that. Were there any studies done? Was there any investigation? People actually want to ride a bike in this town? These are these aspirational goals that people in Portland may have, but it's not tight enough. There's not enough of a rough proportionality. Right? Everyone see that? Yeah, Zoe? So there doesn't just have to be a fit between the interest and how they go about the fulfilling that interest. There has to be, there also has to be a tight fit between the interest and what the landowner is trying to do with their land. Uh, effectively, rough proportionality modifies the essential nexus, right? You know, there has to be some sort of fit and it has to be pretty close. That's the way I look at it. Right? There's got to be a fit, and it's got to be tight. Not too tight, not too loose, somewhere in the middle. This is not precision. This is, we're talking about con law here. So 
Uh, the important part here, though, I want to draw your attention to, um, Kevin, in this case, who bears the burden of showing this fit? And this is an important point at the end. Um, I guess the government. Yes, exactly. So in every case we've done before, Kevin, when any homeowner was challenging a zoning ordinance being unconstitutional, who had the burden? Uh, the homeowner. The only exception was Mount Laurel, which we discussed was the anomaly. Usually, when a government agency passes zoning regulation, and you know, the Euclid family, or Belterra, right? The homeowner has the burden of saying it's unconstitutional. What's critical here is that the chief places the burden on the government. My friends, scrutiny doesn't really matter much. In constitutional litigation, what matters is who has the burden. When you have the burden of persuasion, you're probably going to lose, right? In strict scrutiny, who bears the burden? The government. In rational basis, who has the burden? The plaintiff. The party with the burden loses. So what's so critical here from Rehnquist's perspective is that he assigned the burden to the government. That changes the entire ballgame. So now the government has to show why they can do this. Right? The government can't act and wait to be sued. The government has to show in advance, here's why we can do this. And this was very critical. Okay? And I, it's not without reason why the government has a burden here. This is not a case where they pass a general zoning ordinance applying to the entire city. They pass a one spot zoning rule. They apply this only one piece of property. And the fact they made an exception for this one piece of property says, you should probably have a good reason why. So sure everyone see that? Okay. So basically, with this analysis, handing, dedicating the floodplain doesn't make much sense. Dedicating a bike path doesn't make much sense. There's not much of an essential nexus. It's certainly not proportional. Therefore, this is an unconstitutional exaction. And if the government wants to do this, they have to pay. OK, everyone see this. Uh, I mentioned a case in the notes after it called a uh, uh, Coons v. St. John's River Water Management. This was decided, I think, two years ago. Uh, it's in the next edition of the book, the one I didn't make you buy, but it, it's in the, uh, it was in your book. And this has the interesting question of what happens when the exaction is not an easement but money. What if the state says, okay, we'll let you build if you pay us money. Again, this would be called a bribe, but this is often done. And the court actually said in a vote of five to four, if the government makes you pay money to some agency to do something, that's an exaction. So this is actually a fairly significant case. OK? Any questions? All right. Uh, I will hand these out. Please take a good look at them. We, we do read these closely. Uh, and I will, I will leave, and I will let uh, my friend bring them up.